Over the past few months, we've been making our way through a series of messages entitled Signs of Glory. And we've been indwelling in these stories that the Apostle John, who was Jesus' closest disciple during his earthly life, we've been dwelling in these stories that Apostle John talks about some of these events during Jesus' life, some of these mighty deeds he did. And as we've seen, these mighty deeds are miracles of a high order. But John does not call them miracles. They are, but he does not call them as such. He calls them signs. And that's because sign in the Bible is a technical term referring to miracles that point beyond themselves to something greater than themselves. And what is that something to which these signs point? Glory. The glory of God. The signs point to the glory of God being manifested in Jesus. Glory means luminosity. Glory means weightiness. And glory means essence. To see the glory of God is to see the essence of the living God. To see the glory of God is to see what makes God be God. Now, on this Lord's Day, I invite you to dwell with me in the story of the seventh sign John records, bringing back to life a man named Lazarus who had been in the tomb four days. It's the most dramatic of the seven stories. It is the most spectacular of the seven signs. The story, to me, is one of the most compelling pictures that we have of Jesus anywhere. It's the most comprehensive manifestation of the glory of God that we have in the Bible, surpassed only by the story of Jesus' own death and resurrection. Now, John describes this seventh sign in the 11th chapter of his gospel. The Jewish philosopher of the 17th century, Baruch Spinoza, is reported to have said he would gladly give up his whole system of philosophy to be able to believe what is written in this chapter. I like how my friend, New Testament scholar, Marianne Mai Thompson puts it in her brilliant commentary on the Gospel of John. In John 11, she says, we find ourselves at extremes. On the one hand, the utter helplessness of human beings in the face of death, and on the other hand, the unparalleled authority of Jesus over death. Now, I think this story is told in five acts or five movements. John does not explicitly identify these movements, but I think the story unfolds along these lines. And I've given each of these movements a name. Puzzle, pain, promise, pathos, and power. So our text is John 11, verses 1 through 44. But it's important that we read what comes before the story and what comes after the story. So I'm going to be reading from John chapter 10, verse 40, through 11, verse 46. The longest reading we've had in this series thus far. But this is going to warm you up big time. <laughs> Hear the word of God. Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. That place was Bethany, beyond the Jordan. There he stayed, and many people came to him. They said, though John the Baptist never performed a sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and his sister Martha. Bethany near Jerusalem. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters send word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, 
He stayed where he was two more days. Then he said to the disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews were trying to stone you, and you were going back there? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? A person who walks in the daylight will not stumble, for they who see, see by the world's light. It is when they walk by night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there. So that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, who is known as Did Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had been in the tomb four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come in the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher's here, she said, and he's asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now, Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. Huh, but Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he's been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took the stone away. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you hear me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you've sent me. When he said this, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his head. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did put their faith in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. This is the word of the Lord. Holy Spirit, I stand in awe of you today, realizing that you enabled John to remember this whole story and to remember the dialogue, and that you've preserved this story for us. And I pray now in your mercy and grace that you would take us into the reality of what we've just read as never before, for we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Now, I want you to notice that Although the heart of the story takes place in one Bethany, it actually begins in another Bethany. When Jesus receives the word that his good friend Lazarus has died, he, or is sick, 
He is in Bethany beyond the Jordan, beyond the Jordan River. And through this word, he is being called back to Bethany near Jerusalem. Bethany beyond the Jordan is a place of refuge. Bethany near Jerusalem is a place of danger. Bethany beyond the Jordan is a place of hospitality. People are believing in Jesus there. Bethany near Jerusalem is a place of hostility where people are rejecting Jesus. In Bethany beyond the Jordan, the report is everything John the Baptist said about this man is true. Bethany near Jerusalem, the report is they were seeking all the more to kill him. They picked up stones to throw at him. They were seeking again to seize him. This is why when Jesus finally says he's going to go to this other Bethany, the disciples say to him in verse 8, Rabbi, a short while ago the authorities tried to stone you, and yet you are going there? Scholars point out that John heightens the tension for Jesus using this word there. In John 10, 40, Bethany beyond the Jordan, Jesus was staying there. 10, 42, many believed in him there. 11, 8, regarding returning to Bethany near Jerusalem, the disciples ask, are you going there? Are you going to leave safe Bethany to go to dangerous Bethany? The point Lazarus will live because Jesus is willing to die. Lazarus will live because Jesus is willing to die. That's the gospel within the gospel of John. We will live because Jesus is willing to die. Now to this story of extremes. It's a drama in five movements. Puzzle, pain, promise, pathos, and power. As you heard and saw when we read the story, there are four main characters in the drama. Jesus, his good friend Lazarus, and Lazarus' two sisters, Martha and Mary. Movement one, puzzle. The drama begins on a note all too familiar to us in this fallen world. Verse 3, Lord, the one you love is sick. Apparently, this sickness was very serious for the two sisters, trouble someone, to travel a whole day on foot to inform Jesus of this crisis. The message is simple. It's full of urgency. Lord, behold, the one whom you love is sick. Now, how often have we sent messages like this to Jesus? Lord, behold, my child is really sick. Lord, behold, my grandmother has cancer. As Jesus receives the message, we are therefore watching with deep personal vested interest in how Jesus responds to this message. And we're puzzled by his response. Verse 4, this sickness will not end in death. What does he mean? The words cannot mean, they cannot mean, Lazarus will not go to the grave because of this sickness. His words cannot mean that, for Jesus is aware at this point in the story that in the time it took the messenger to bring the news, Lazarus has died. Indeed, Lazarus has already been buried. It was and is the custom in that part of the world to bury those who die on the day that they die. So Jesus knows that Lazarus' body has already been wrapped and bound and laid in the tomb. So what does he mean, this sickness is not unto death? The clue is what he goes on to say, verse 4 again, rather it is for the glory of God. Death will not be the last word in the events surrounding Lazarus' sickness. The last word will be the glory of God, the luminous, weightiness, essence of the living God. That's true of every one of our stories. Now, this does not mean that God made Lazarus sick and let him die so God would have a way to glorify himself. Rather, it means that Jesus, being who he is, can turn this event from tragedy into an occasion for the essence of God to be manifested. How? At this point, we do not know. It's a puzzle. Now, the puzzle is further complicated by Jesus' further response to the news. John writes, verse 5, Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus. And then, 
Yet, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. What's this? Jesus loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus. If, if he loved them, why does he stay in safe Bethany two more days? Why not get up and head off to dangerous Bethany? At, again, at this point in the story, we do not know. It's a puzzle. We do, however, discover something we simply have to accept about Jesus. Later, we will see that Jesus fully identifies with the pain of Lazarus' sisters, and he does something about it. But here we discover that Jesus is not controlled by or driven by our desires. Remember in the first sign in Cain of Galilee at the wedding feast when the wine ran out? His mother urges him to do something about it. You who know the Gospel of John well, remember the time when Jesus' brothers urged him to go up to Jerusalem during the Feast of Tabernacles to show himself to the world? One New Testament scholar ties those two events together with the one we're looking at today and makes this observation. In all three cases, the urge for action came from those near or dear. In all three cases, their request was refused. In all three cases, Jesus, in the end, does what is suggested, but in all three, only after it had been made clear that he did what he did in God's time according to God's will. As Jesus said after healing the man who had been lame for 38 years, the third sign, I can do nothing of my own initiative. Jesus only does what he sees the Father doing and only when the Father tells him to do it. He's not controlled by the urgency of our needs. Oh, he cares deeply, as we're going to see. But his schedule is not dictated by us. The puzzle is even more perplexing. Jesus says to his disciples, verse 11, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, and I'm going there to wake him out of sleep. The disciples respond, verse 12, oh, good. My paraphrase, oh, good. If he sleep, he'll be just fine. So Jesus then makes it plain, verse 14, Lazarus is dead, and I'm glad for your sake I was not there so that you might believe. Glad. Jesus is glad. Why? Because their faith is going to grow. How? How can faith grow when a loved one dies, when our youngest son, whom we adopted from an orphanage in Moscow, died at the age of 29, how is that going to make Sharon's and my faith grow? Again, at this point in the story, we do not know. But we are being told that Jesus can even use death to strengthen disciples' faith. Puzzle. Movement two, pain. Jesus finally arrives at Bethany near Jerusalem, and as he does, he's brought it into the deepest pain of the human condition. John tells us that by the time Jesus arrives in the village, Lazarus has been in the tomb four days. This number four is significant, four days. It was believed at that time that, the soul, that when someone died, the soul of the one who dies stays near the tomb for about three days. It was believed that during those days, the soul is watching for an opportunity to return to the body. But it was believed that on the fourth day, the soul realizes the body has decomposed too much and gives up and leaves. The fourth day is therefore the day that hope finally dies. Mourning and grief reach their deepest depth on the fourth day. The pain is most acute for Martha and Mary on the fourth day, for now Lazarus really is gone. By the way, it's the fourth day after someone dies that we most need the comfort of our friends. During the first few days after death, we're in shock. We're numb. We're still hoping we're going to wake up and find out that this was just a bad dream. But by the fourth day, reality sinks in, and there's a need for comfort as never before. 
We encounter this pain first in Martha. She hears Jesus is arriving in dangerous Bethany, leaves the village, and runs out to meet him on the road. She says to him, verse 21, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Her words are at once an affirmation of faith. My brother would not have died. But they're also a venting of anger. They're a rebuke. If you had been there. All of us can feel her pain. Lord, if you had been there, my daughter would not have died. If you had been here, my husband would have been healed. If you had been there, our son would not have fallen off the cliff. Martha affirms Jesus' power and yet reveals her profound disappointment that Jesus did not choose to exercise that power before the fourth day. Martha's hurt and she's angry. She knows how long it took her message to get from Bethany that is safe to Be Bethany that's dangerous to Bethany to safe. She knew how long it took. One day. She knows how long it takes for Jesus to come from that Bethany back to the other Bethany. One day. Jesus could have been there in two days. He could have been there two full days before hope died. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. Her follow-up words only deepen the pain. Verse 22. I know that even now, whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Even her, in her pain, she, can, she, she expresses her confidence in Jesus' prayers, but she's not sure what Jesus is going to pray. Now, I want you to notice what Jesus does not do in the encounter with angry, grieving Martha. He does not defend himself. He does not try to change her feelings. It means that we can approach our Lord and let the feelings be. We can dare to feel what we feel in his presence and express those feelings. In the face of death, there are so many conflicting, so many conflicting feelings. There's denial. This, this can't be happening. There's anger. Why him? Why her? Why me? There's depression. I'm not sure I can go on living in this pain. And Jesus allows Martha to feel it all and express it all. Jesus can handle our anger and resentment and tough questions. Pain is real, and Martha expresses it to her Lord. Puzzle, pain, movement three, promise. In the midst of this deep pain is a wonderful promise. He first of all says to Martha, verse 23, your brother will live again. He's gently reminding Martha of the general hope of the resurrection at the end of time. There was the conviction, the doctrine, that was held by the lay leaders of that time, the Pharisees. They believed that there would be a great getting up day in the future. They held this belief in fierce disagreement with the scholarly leaders of the day, the Sadducees. The Sadducees did not believe in this resurrection on the last day. And, and you may have heard the saying, and that is why they're sad, you see. I wanted to make sure everybody got it. <laughs> Martha's response reveals that although she believes in this general hope, it is not helpful at that particular time in her pain. I know, she says. Verse 24, I know he'll rise again on the last day. Then Jesus speaks directly to her pain. And his words are for many, the most comforting words he ever spoke. Verses 25 and 26, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, literally believe into me, will live even though they die. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. I hear a lot of you use the language lean into when you're speaking of a call to serve or you're speaking of some special event. You call others to lean into with you. I think that's the best way to translate believe. Lean into. I am the resurrection and the life. Those who lean into me will live even if they die, and those who live and lean into me will never die. Now, how does this great promise, this great claim, meet Martha in her pain? 
Jesus says, I am the resurrection. Those who believe in me will live even if they die. Verse 25, I am the resurrection. Those who lean into me will live even if they die. I am the resurrection. Not I will be the resurrection, but I am now, before the last day, before I myself am resurrected, I am the resurrection. Probably the most audacious thing Jesus of Nazareth ever said. Something no one ever said, something no one else can say. Jesus is saying that for those who believe into him, death is not going to be the last word over them. They may go to the grave, but they're going to go through that grave into another order of life. And then Jesus says, verse 25 again, I am the life. It's this claim that gives meaning to I am the resurrection. Let me show you. The linking of resurrection and life points to the heart of Jesus' gospel. In the last days, to which Martha refers, God is going to give his people a whole new order of existence, a radically different quality of life. And the Greek word that's used to describe that new order of existence is zoe. The Greek word used to describe this present order of existence is bios. And the difference between bios and zoe is much greater than the difference between biological life and zoological life. Much different, hugely different, a quantum leap difference. Bios is the life we get from our family, from our parents. It's a good life, right? It's a beautiful life, right? At least most of the time. But as good and beautiful as bios is, it runs down, it decays, it moves slowly but surely to disintegration and decomposition, it moves toward death as we all experience, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. But zoe, <laughs> zoe, Zoe life does not run down. Zoe life does not decay. Zoe has no end. It cannot end. Why? Because Zoe is the life that God lives. Zoe is the life that God is. The living God is Zoe. Now, here's how Jesus' great promise ministers to Martha in her great pain. And it's a present reality. Zoe life is in Jesus. More to the point, Zoe life is Jesus. I am the Zoe. Now get this. Whoever believes in Jesus receives his Zoe. Whoever leans into Jesus now receives his Zoe. Now, now, right now, ahead of the last days, ahead of the end of time, before going to the grave. Zoe life cannot be touched by death. By us can, but not Zoe. Zoe life cannot be altered or destroyed by the grave. So Jesus says in verse 26, I am the Zoe. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Why? Because they have Zoe, which can never die. Thank you. <laughs> Thus, back to the second sign of glory that we looked at in John 4 in the story about the royal official, official who comes up from Capernaum to, Ga to Cana, and he asks Jesus to come back down to Cana and heal his son who's about to die. Jesus says to the official, your son lives. Not, as some translations have it, your son will live, although that's true, but your son lives. And the word that Jesus uses is zoe. Your son zoes. Now, it turns out this boy also is granted life on bios. So Jesus could have said, your son bioses. <laughs> But this son would one day get sick, and he would die, and his bios life would end, but not his zoe life. Your son lives, and even if he dies, he's going to live. Isn't this wonderful news? Jesus is saying to Martha and to you and to me, yes, one day on the last day, Lazarus is going to have a new bodily existence. But in me, ahead of that last day, he has zoe. And therefore, this, his zoe has not been destroyed by going into the grave. That's why Jesus could earlier say about Lazarus that he slept. And that's why Jesus could say this sickness is not unto death. In Jesus, the last days have already dawned. Anglican missionary to India, Leslie Newbigin, put it so well. Jesus is in himself, in his own person, the eschatos, 
the end as he is the beginning. Resurrection is no longer a mere doctrine. It has a living face and a name. Isn't that good? Resurrection is not a mere doctrine. It has a living face and a name. Jesus is himself the presence of the life, which is God's gift beyond the grave. And then this, to be bound to Jesus by faith is to share already now the life that is beyond the grave. The very real and deep pain is met by the real and deep promise. I am the resurrection and the life. Those who live and lean into me never die. Puzzle, pain, promise. Movement four, pathos. Mary then enters the picture. She says to Jesus the same thing Martha said to him. Verse 32, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Then, says John, Mary fell at Jesus' feet. If you read the Gospels, you find Mary always falling at Jesus' feet. Whether out of adoration or sorrow, she falls at Jesus' feet. And John says she weeps, and the others who are consoling her also weep. The word that John uses for Mary's weeping means to wail, to cry loudly, noisily, without restraint. We see this wailing take place all over the, in different parts of the world. The soul crying out without restraint, pathos. John tells us that when Jesus saw Mary and the others wailing, he was greatly disturbed. Verse 33, Jesus was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Now, the word moved in spirit is a strong emotional word. It's hard to render into English. The word was mostly used of horses. When horses are agitated, they rear up on their front legs and they wave their paws in the air and they snort in spirit in great anguish. This word conveys inarticulate anger, pathos. Why is Jesus so agitated? Why is he so angry? Because people are wailing? Hardly. The reason is more fundamental. Death was not in the creator's original plan. Death is a result of sin. God had warned our first parents that if they rejected God and tried to live without God, that would immediately lead to death. Genesis 2.17, you will surely die. Humanity's disobedience and rebellion brought into being this horrible reality. And on that day in dangerous Bethany, Jesus the creator made flesh, was standing face to face with this destruction of his good creation. And he was angry. Blessed be his name. He's rising up on, the paw, on his legs and he's waving his paws in the sky and he's snorting his spirit because this ought not be. Oh. I hear in his agitation, this is not what we planned. And that's why it's wholly right for us to be angry in the face of death because our creator is true. I gotta catch my breath. <laughs> I don't think I over-dramatized that. That's what that verb means. And says, John, Jesus was also troubled. Verse 33, as Mary weeps, Jesus is deeply moved and troubled. Now, this verb that John uses this time implies that Jesus lets down all protective guard, as I did, and feels what those around him are feeling. The verb means to voluntarily and deliberately Accept and make as one's own the emotion and experience of death. Pathos. And then comes the shortest verse in the Bible, John eleven thirty five, 35, and Jesus wept. The verb used this time is different from Mary's weeping. This verb means to quietly shed tears. What a tender picture after expressing his rage. Jesus quietly sheds tears. Four attributes of God are affirmed by most religions and religious philosophies. God is infinite. God is incomprehensible. God is indivisible. And God is impassable. The Greeks put it, God is apathetic, unfeeling. You see, for the Greeks... 
They thought that for God to be God, God could not be affected by anything outside of God's self. God cannot be moved by anything else, for in the Greek mind, that implies that God could be, then be controlled by reality outside himself. Therefore, for God to be God, God cannot experience emotions, whether pleasant or painful. And of course, this means that God cannot suffer. The living God is impassable, apathetic, unfeeling. Now, this is the view held by most religions in our time most philosophies in our time. Thus, for example, when a Muslim suffers, she can suffer with Allah, I mean, for Allah, but never with Allah. And this view also permeated the thinking of the Christian church. From the second century AD until the 19th century, the impassibility of God, the apathy of God was a tenet of orthodoxy. The living one cannot be moved by the realities of life and still be divine. Oh, the church theologians did speak of the love of God for the broken world, but that love was a, a decision. It, it was not a feeling. The church theologians could not affirm God's capacity to feel with others because it implied that God could be controlled by reality outside of God's self. Ah, says Jorgen Bultmann, the German theologian who suffered the horrors of Nazi concentration camp. The church theologians made the mistake of thinking there were only two alternatives, either God's essential incapacity to suffer or God's being subject to others if he did suffer. Moltmann argued there's a third alternative, namely, the voluntary laying oneself open to another and allowing oneself to be intimately affected by the other. Let that picture grab your soul. Standing outside the tomb of Lazarus, weeping with his weeping sister, is the living God, wrenched by the agony of the human condition. In a while, he will wipe away all tears, but as long as there are tears, he feels them as deeply as those who cry them. Running down, the cheeks of Jesus of Nazareth are the tears of the infinite, incomprehensible, indivisible, but deeply feeling God. Glory. We beheld his glory. Henri Nouwen put it so well. When Jesus was moved to compassion, the source of all life trembled. The ground of all love burst open, and the abyss of God's immense, inexhaustible, and unfathomable tenderness revealed itself. Puzzle, pain, promise, pathos, and movement five, power. Jesus did not stop at identifying with pain. He lets his pathos, pathos move him to act. So verse 39, take away the stone, he says, Take away the stone. We can forgive Martha for her protest. Lord, by this time, there's going to be a bad odor. He's been in there four days. Or if you know the King James Version, behold, he stinketh. <laughs> Jesus responds, verse 40, did I not tell you that if you believed, you'd see the glory of God? Then John tells us, Jesus prays, and then without any fanfare or hype, he gives a command, a wonderful command. Verse 33, Lazarus, come out. What is this? The man from Galilee, tear strains on his face, standing before the hard, cold reality of death, crying out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. What is he doing? Who does Jesus think he is? Who? He's the one who, in the beginning, pierced the darkness with the command, let there be light. And from deep inside this tomb, Four days after being laid in it, on the day that hope had died, Lazarus gets up and comes out. Lazarus would one day die again and would go into the tomb. He would go into the grave one more time. But on that day in dangerous Bethany, Jesus demonstrated to Lazarus' sisters and to the watching world that in him we live even if we die. So St. Irenaeus was right. The glory of God is a human being made fully alive. And the next thing we read is that the religious leaders plot to kill Jesus. 
That's how hard-hearted religion can get. Jesus will die because he made Lazarus live. And because Jesus is willing to die, we too will live. Puzzle, pain, promise, pathos, power, and one more movement, present. Implication one. Jesus has authority over the great enemy. He has authority over death. And he will demonstrate that for all time when he walks out the tomb himself. Implication two, we do not need to fear death. We do, but we do not need to. Because if we're bound to him who is the resurrection, we need not be afraid to die. For if I am in him, I do not die. When I die, I live. When the bios decays, the zoe goes on. I will be gone, but I will not be dead. I have officiated at many memorial services over the past 50 years. And whenever I do a memorial for a believer, I try to work in the phrase, gone, but not dead. Somewhere in the service, I will say, your loved one is gone, but she's not dead. Your loved one is gone, but he's not dead. I said it at my father's memorial. I said it at my mother's memorial. I said it at my two brothers' memorial. I said it during our son's memorial. I have said it for many friends' memorial. And Sharon knows that on, at my memorial, I want someone to say, Daryl is gone, but he's not dead. Grandpa's gone, but he's not dead. Those who live in Jesus the resurrection do not die. They may suffer. They may go through an agonizing process of dying, but we do not die, and therefore we do, not need to, we do not need to live in fear of death. Gone but not dead. Do you believe this? Jesus asked us as he asked Martha. Implication three. We already have the life. We will live beyond the grave. I say, gone but not dead, because in relationship with Jesus, we already have the life we'll enjoy beyond the grave. I am the life, he says. Not I will be the life on the last days, although that is true, but I am Zoe now. And in relationship with Zoe himself, we have Zoe now. Which is why Jesus could say, on that day before coming to dangerous Bethany, what he said in Jerusalem after healing the paralytic, John 5, 24. Listen, John 5, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. Or as some versions have it, have crossed over death from death to life. Has already, now. Whoever is leaning into Jesus right now already has the life of the deathless God. This is why I say to those who are wrestling with whether or not to follow Jesus, you are going to follow someone Everyone follows someone. Just make sure that the someone you choose to follow can deal with death. I conclude by leaving you a question. It'll take some time for you to adequately answer it. I'm just going to pose it, and then I'll pray. Here's the question. Ready? How do we live the rest of our lives knowing that Zoe is in us? How do we live the rest of our lives knowing we will never die? How do we live the rest of our lives knowing that in Jesus we will live forever? <laughs> 